Hello and welcome to the Bikes for Death podcast. I'm your host, Patrick, and this is the show that talks about bikepacking, adventuring, and the cool people who participate. Well, I hate to uh, toot my own horn, but I've got another banger guest for y'all today. Um, I feel like, oh man, I've been so lucky lately with all the people who I've been able to chat with and uh, and, and bring you those stories. Um, it's been pretty freaking sweet. And today is no different. Today I have Chris Burkhard on the show. With 3.4 million Instagram followers, I'm sure almost all of y'all are familiar with Chris. But did you know that he's a cyclist? And did you know that he just broke the world record for the WOW Cyclothon in Iceland? He did it in 52 hours, 36 minutes, and 19 seconds. And that's an 844-mile race that uh, goes around the circumference of Iceland. He beat the previous world record by three and a half hours. It's funny. I refer to him as a legit cyclist and he takes issue with that <laughs> regardless of whether he is a legit cyclist or not. Uh, he legit just broke the world record for the wow cyclothon. So I thought this was a perfect opportunity to have him on the show. I asked him if he would come on and talk about that. I really wanted to um, share a different side of Chris. Um, Everybody knows about, you know, most people are familiar with him as a photographer, a uh, he's known for his yoga and rock climbing and surfing. Um, but there's very, very little information out there about him as a cyclist. So, uh, he's obviously a a great spokesman for the sport and I'm glad to have him on team cyclist. And it was a true honor to, um, to have about an hour with him, uh, to chat on the phone. You know, he, he is a really busy guy, as you can imagine. And, uh, I caught up to him, uh, on his way from, uh, his house or wherever he was to LAX because right after he got done uh, winning in Iceland, he came back to the States and started prepping for a three week shoot out in Russia. So, you know, I just had to, I basically just had to snag a little bit of his time in between those uh, two epic adventures. Yeah, it was, it was freaking sweet, man. What a, what a, I mean, just an inspirational character this guy is. I mean, uh, he, on, on so many different levels, it's crazy. I mean, there's there's people who, you know, are really good at one thing um, or maybe a couple things, but I feel like this guy just excels at everything that he does, and he does it with humility, uh, which is awesome. You know, the fact that he was even willing to, you know, take some time and come on my little old podcast and talk to us. Uh, is is pretty cool, and I think it, it speaks to the kind of person that he is. Um, so, yeah, man, before we get to the show, uh, this is where I politely beg for your support. Um, if you love this kind of content and uh, you want to keep it going, your support uh, means everything. You know, whenever I started this podcast, I was thinking that I would do like 10 maybe 12 episodes like the first year um but we're sitting here first of july and this is number shit 17 i think i'm losing count you know uh it's been it's been wild and that's uh that's simply a result of all the people who have uh, just either reached out and sent me a message or contribute on patreon or in other, in whatever way you can If you would like to support the show, you can do so in three easy ways. Uh, You can financially support the show on Patreon. Uh, You can find me there at Bikes for Death. All my Patreons get uh, cool swag, whether it is uh, a sticker or a patch. Another great way you can support the show, it doesn't cost you a dime. All you have to do is go to my website. It's bikesfordeath.com. There's an Amazon affiliate link there if you will click it and bookmark it and use it every time you shop online. I get a little cut and it's so cool. Um, We've already had like nine of y'all go ahead, go on there and and place orders. And I've made like $9 or eight, you know, $8 and 81 cents or something. So, you know, I'm not going to get rich, but dude, I'll take it. You know, I I appreciate that. I really do. 
Um, and the last way that you can support the show is just simply by going onto iTunes and leaving a five star review. Uh, it really goes a long way in helping the show reach a broader audience. So whenever, whenever y'all leave a rating or share it with your friends or whatever, it really does go a long way. Um, the show continues to climb on the iTunes charts and that is pretty freaking sweet if you think about it. All right. And one last thing I just forgot to mention that Chris, like I said, Chris was on his way to the airport. Um, we were having a call via Skype. It's going to get garbly a couple times. It's not too bad. I think you can mostly make out what he was saying. Um, and you hear like blinkers and stuff like that. But you know, anyway, I didn't care. I was thrilled to talk to him and I hope you're equally as thrilled, uh, with this conversation. Hey guys, Chris Picard, he rides bikes. Just saying. Now let's get to the show. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, first of all, hey man, thank you so much for uh, for taking the time to talk to me, man. I really appreciate it. Uh, absolutely, yeah. No, I'm I'm super stoked to chat and connect, and um, I'm just uh, it just kind of seemed fortuitous since I'm heading down to uh, LAX and have some time to kill and um, I'll be uh, in Russia for about two weeks. So I, I think this is, uh, this is the best time to make it happen. Perfect. Well, do you have any uh, questions or anything before we get started? No, man, I'm good. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a fan of the podcast and had a chance to listen to a bunch of episodes. And I, I, I like the surprise of kind of not knowing what, what the question is going to be, to be honest. Yeah. I, I prefer that. Um, I think it, it lends itself to a much more organic conversation and more natural and all that. So, all right, everyone. Today I have with me Chris Burkhard, who is uh, graciously given some of his time to uh, to talk to us today, specifically about um, you and cycling. Obviously, this is the Bikes or Death podcast, and if you're if you like look on your Wikipedia or you do a Google search with you and cycling there's very little information out there so <laughs> yeah, i'm looking yes, to i'm sure. looking to change that i want to get on i want to get this on your wikipedia or something um <laughs> yeah let's do it man if you're out <laughs> yeah it's just i mean so you uh i want to kind of talk more a little bit later about uh the wow cyclothon but just to tease it a little bit you are fresh off of just breaking the record um, for the wow cyclothon in Iceland by three and a half hours. So, I mean, yeah, you're, yeah. you're a legitimate cyclist. I mean, you're known as being a, a photographer. Um, I don't know about that. That's definitely not a title that I, that I'd, <laughs> I'd be throwing around on myself, but I, you know, I think in many ways it's, uh, it's always just been something that's been fun, you know, and always been a, a way of, of experiencing the world in a more intimate way. You know, it, there's that old, Edward Abbey quote, um, it says, you know, you'll, you'll experience more in a single mile by foot or by bike or by horse by, than by a hundred miles by car. Yeah. And I think that there's so much truth to that. You know, that, that really, to me is like a huge, um, I think that just really rings true. So I love that quote. I'm so glad that when Ed Edward wrote that he included, uh, bikes on there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Are you an Edward Abbey fan? Oh yeah. Huge. Yeah. I mean, desert solitaire, and monkey yeah. ranch gang are, are, you know, for me, you know, they, they definitely sit next to, uh, the Bible as, as some of the more important books ever written, I guess you could say. I couldn't uh, agree um, more. But yeah, I mean, his, just, just his, uh, his ethos, and, you know, our relationship with, with public lands and, and, or just, you know, wilderness in general is really important. And I think more so his almost like, I look at his books as almost like a, a guidebook for how to experience those places. Right. Uh, which is, I think what makes them, makes it so significant, you know? Yeah. I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. I actually had uh, one of my favorite Edward Abbey quotes written down. Um, if you don't mind, I'll just read it real quick. I'm sure you're familiar yeah. with it. Uh, you can't see anything from a car. You've got to get out of the goddamn contraption and walk. Better yet, crawl on your hands and knees over the sandstone and through the thorn bush and cactus. When traces of blood begin to mark your trail, you'll see something, maybe. Spot on. I love it. Yeah. I mean, he, he's just got a way with words that's so descriptive, and I think that's what makes him so unique, you know. And um, 
you know, growing up in California and spending all the time in the desert Southwest, I think he's, he's always been like a real, um, you know, kind of spiritual guide, so to say, as to how to, um, how to kind of relate to these places. I couldn't agree more. He's informed a lot of my personal opinions on, yeah, my relationship with, with wild places for sure. Um, yeah, I just, I, I, I had to bring that up because I, I had read somewhere that you were, um, you were inspired in part by that quote by Edward Abbey. Um, and he, I'm obviously a big fan of his. And I think probably most people who are, have an intimate relationship with wild places are. Um, so yeah, I mean, you don't strike, I mean, you're a busy guy, obviously, and you don't strike yeah. me as somebody <laughs> who's going to like, just pick up cycling for fun. So why did you get into cycling? Like what role well, was that filling in your life? Well, that's a good question. Um, so I actually used to ride a lot like five years ago, um, before I had kids. Uh, so maybe six, seven years ago, actually, um, I, I had an office, my office was close to my house and I was just so sick of driving my car. And so I, I bought a bike on Craigslist. Um, I live in a, I live near a college town. So I literally like bought a $400 bike on Craigslist and I was like, Oh cool. Now I can commute. So I started commuting. Uh, to work and I, you know, it was rad. And then I was like, oh, this commuting thing's really fun. <laughs> and I was like, I'm going to ride longer. So I started riding like, you know, longer days and on the weekends I'd ride. And, um, and then, you know, every, you know, that turned into like, you know, 20 miles and 30 miles. And, um, and then I told my wife, I was like, you know, I'd love to do a, a century. And I did like my first century and, um, you know, a long time ago. And I, I was like, it was an amazing experience. And, couldn't feel my balls for a week. I was like, you know, on the, <laughs> the worst, wrong, worst saddle ever. No bike fit. Had no idea what was going on. Um, I wasn't even using, you know, clipless pedals. Right. Um, and, uh, it was just classic, you know, because I bought this crappy $400 bike and I just rode, rode the hell out of it. And anyway, I had kids and that's, you know, something that really puts a damper on spending mm -hmm. a lot of time outside. Cycling is challenging because you need to like, you know, usually like, spend a couple hours doing it, you know, you can't like go get like a pretty concerted workout or, you know, this and that it's, it's, it's like a lot, sometimes a little bit of a, a lot of prep and then, you know, you got to get out of the city or you got to get, you know, to where you want to go. So anyway, it kind of put a damper on things. And then, you know, now my kids are pretty much self-sufficient, you know, when they, when they get out of diapers and they start, you know, being right. able to like put their cars, put their, you know, buckle themselves and feed themselves. <laughs> it's like, it's pretty rad. So, I've had more time and I just was like, you know, I don't want to pick this back up. And, um, I knew a couple of friends who worked specialized and, um, they got me a deal on a bike. And so I, I was able to basically just kind of get that stoke of having, you know, a new piece of equipment and wanting to like put it to the test. And yeah. it was, yeah, I was like fired up. So that to me, to be honest, was the catalyst for getting back into it. And then as soon as I did, you know, it's like anything else. Like I, with photography, it's always been fun to, plan and execute like an expedition whether it's to russia or iceland or norway like the objective is always kind of um as fulfilling as the process of, of creating it right or of like doing the research and so for me yeah. I, I always love this idea of like oh well, what if we go do this ride or what if we connect these roads right. or what if we like go out and do like this death valley ride from you know in, you know none of this stuff that i was doing is really new uh, but for me it was new and and that was exciting and i was just like you know, the more, the longer you ride, the more you find out things about yourself. You know, this is just pretty standard. It's like, what does a hundred miles feel like? Mm -hmm. What does 200 miles feel like? What does 300 miles feel like? What is, you know, and what then is what going happens 52 beyond... hours with no sleep feel yeah. like? <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and I, you know, the no sleep, the no sleep thing is funny. Like, I feel like that's just kind of a part of the equation when it comes to the, the work that I do. But, you know, as a photographer traveling and shooting expeditions, there are moments where you, you definitely have to get by with less and I've become a bit more accustomed to that. Um, but I definitely made a concerted effort on that ride to like rest and prep. And like, I like knowing, knowing that I was going into it and making that call was very, very easy. It was actually like 65 hours of no sleep. If you in count total. it all up. Yeah. It, yeah. Because the, like I, I woke up at 11 AM, um, you know, on, on the 25th and then I went to bed at, 2 a.m. on the 28th or something wow. like that it was pretty gnarly um but anyway yeah. uh yeah uh, like so that's kind of what got me into it and i just the you know this the internal exploration like i don't know anything about bikes i don't really care about this or that like you right. know 
yeah, the, 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 the cost, the value, the this, anything, all that really is kind of besides the point of like, how does it make you feel inside and, and how does it make you experience the world around you? And that's Preach. been really, really fun. Yeah. To like yeah. dig deep and just like learn something new about yourself. I, I love, love, love that you just said that. Um, that's one big thing that I preach to people and I, I just want to reiterate it because it's so important. I mean, you went out, bought a $400 bike off Craigslist. You went and rode a century on flats. You know, you weren't wearing probably all the right gear and had, didn't have the coolest bike or whatever, but that is not what's important whenever you're going out and doing those things. And as a cult, like as a cycling culture, I'd like to see that shift to more what's going on inside you, inside your head. How are you, you know, processing the world as you as you experience it via a bicycle or, or whatever it may be but there's so much more there than just having the cool bike or whatever you know right well and the funny thing is like i come from a very like stigma minded uh you know um at, like the sports that i shoot you know surfing and whatnot it's all about like what you're wearing and how you look and you know a lot of like coop culture and this and that and and to come into a sport like that where i'm just like you know i don't I couldn't even identify somebody that wasn't cool or not, you know, I wouldn't really <laughs> care. And, and now, and you know, nowadays, you know, obviously I've got all the, all the gear and all of this and all of that. And I, you know, and I, and I know what I'm looking for, but, but personally, like the experience doesn't matter. Like it's, people are always surprised because when I was doing a lot of these training rides for the Iceland race, I was just reaching out to people online and being like, Hey, you want to come ride? Like meet me here, you know, just make sure you like understand that I'm going to, I'm not going to stop and, or I'm like, I'm, I'm finishing this objective. If you want to join rad, like if you can hack it, great. So I met like a bunch of random people online. And this is the funniest thing is people are always reaching out being like, Oh man, I want to join you for a trip or an experience or whatever. And I'm like, and when you offer them the opportunity, you know, very few people come forward. Hmm. Right. Um, but it, it be just because like, you know, inevitably there, there has to be some sort of a, um, a barrier of entry and that barrier of entry for me, it was like, well, let's ride from San Francisco to Santa Cruz, you mm -hmm. know, or let's ride from San Francisco to slow or let's do this. So it's kind of been a, um, a cool thing to just meet people and experience people that I never would have. And like, it's such a fun way to like, just communicate while you're riding bikes, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It seems like the like endurance side of the sport, uh, mm -hmm. is what is appealing to you more like with the longer distance rides and the one that you yeah. just did. Do you know, yeah, do you yeah. know why uh, that 100%. is? Um, absolutely. I think it's super simple. Like I think anybody can go hard and go fast and, 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 and blow up at the end of that, you know, and like, you know, just, just completely famished, like, you know, after a 20 mile ride or a couple hours or this and that. But I think that for me, I'm looking for an experience that taps into more than just what I can physically do. Because to be honest, the physical side of it's totally bullshit. Like that's like not that big of a deal. Like yeah. I don't think that has much to do with it at all. It's the mental yes. side of it that I think is really where it, like that's where I actually trained. Like the mental side is what I trained. I think that's that's what I was like. That's the experience I look for. Is like after two, three, four, you know, six hours even too. Like let's say six hours is kind of the threshold. Ever you know, pretty much anybody could do a century off the couch if they really really like grinned and bared it right mm -hmm. but after that like things get weird you know like things start to hurt and you need to be taking enough salt and you need to be thinking about your route and you need to be thinking about the wind you, you, you're thinking about what you brought like there's all of these elements to it you know and i love i love considering that okay i'm tapping into like not just the physical side but like okay w what am i eating how is the nutrition fact for hours even if you train you need to build a route where you're going to be passing by places that are going to be open 24 hours right. so like even the simple aspect of like building training routes that are like 24 hours long like you you know i live in a pretty rural area like i go on these rides where i'm not by any cars or out of cell service like they were full on you know missions some of these rides and a lot of them i, I would ride through the night yeah. um i'd leave at like 11 p.m and i'd ride through the night why simple it's because it's so empty and the roads are totally deserted and you can ride with a headlight and you can you don't you aren't more complacent but you can be a little a little more relaxed yeah i think yeah most people you are know? sleeping there's less cars i think you're more visible with yeah. all your blinky lights oh, and everything i i way, live at night way man. more visible 
yeah i I love it i love it too it's honestly it's cool it's like middle of the night you like roll into some gas station and you're like i need a hot chocolate or something like that and <laughs> people are like tripping out you're like all reflective yeah um, so yeah. yeah the training for me was was huge the mental part of it was was really where i think that i i succeeded because i knew from just doing hard things in life climbing you know you know whether, whether it's like you know big wall climbing or or this or that, you know, I, I understood that you need to break down some of these mental scenarios. And for me, it was like, well, what is it going to feel like to ride when I'm sick? What mm-hmm. is it going to feel like to ride when I'm full and bloated and have GI distress? Like, mm-hmm. what is it going to feel like to ride when my butt hurts and, and when I'm super tired? And I literally rode under all those conditions. Right. Like I, I, and I tried to ride a lot through the night feeling what it would feel like to be tired on the bike and what do I do and what do I need? And, how much caffeine do I need and how much, you know, what, what can I get by with? Um, yeah, that's smart. I mean, you don't, you don't want the first time you experience those things to be on a race, you know, like, Oh yeah. I mean, you know what it's like to bonk, you know, too. It's <laughs> like, I, I wanted to ride till I bonk. So I'd go do rides where I didn't eat anything and drink anything but water for like 150 miles. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, like that. that crap, that crash sucks. Like it doesn't feel good, but, right. and then I'm like, okay, what do I need to get out of it? So I would, I would test all these scenarios and, and honestly, I live in a fairly like, um, like the weather's pretty mellow where I'm at. I'm in central California. Mm -hmm. So we, we get a lot of like fog and rain and chilly winters, you know, but nothing, we don't get snow. We don't get hail. Um, we don't get like catabatic wind, but we get pretty bad wind. Um, and so I would just try to ride whenever the weather was bad, like, like going out yeah. in the rain being like, Hey, I'm going to ride for 12 hours. You know, that was, That's awesome. that was also, you know, it was helpful. Cause I'm like, well, where's gonna, where's water going to seep in? Where's it going to feel uncomfortable? And, yeah. um, so yeah, that was a big part of it. I, I love it, man. You, you don't need to be going and doing this. You're doing this for fun. I, I, you know, oh, I assume, 100%. I mean, <laughs> completely self. I mean, nobody's holding the gun to my head being yeah. like, you, you have to ride. So it's just, Honestly, it's I've I've gone through cycles in life where I've been like climbing is everything. I want to climb, you know, um, half dome and I, you know climb the face of half dome or we just like put your all your time and energy into training and climbing still a really big part of my life. Surfing still a really big part of my life. Yoga is a huge part of my life too. But with cycling, I just I have been to Iceland 34 times. Mm-hmm. It's a place that I love. And to be honest, when when my friend who lives there told me about this race. I was immediately like, that would be so badass. Like, and I like thought about how long I had ridden, which at the time was like the longest I'd ridden was like 112 miles. And then I was like, wait, this is a hundred and this is, you know, 850 miles. Basically, <laughs> I was like, what would I need to do to, to do that? And, and I put it off, in the back, I put it in the back of my head for like six years. Oh, and wow. then, you know, yeah. Like, I mean, this is like a long time ago. And I, and I literally like, when I got a new bike, I was kind of like, you know what? if I don't set a goal, I'm not going to train. And I know that I'm, I'm very goal oriented. Yeah. I've always been that way, whether it's career or whether it's whatever, but to be honest in my own career, um, I found a lot of success by basically putting my own personal needs and desires and friendships and health on the back burner. Right. And, uh, and so I was always like work, work, work. And I, I this this last year, um, this last year I, I actually sat down and I told myself, I was like, I'm going to dedicate a little more time to me okay. and I'm going to give a little more time to the things that I love because these, these opportunities, the peak of health are going to be leaving you. Yeah. And I'm, I don't want to like, I don't want to always be like, Oh, that would be fun someday. Like mm-hmm. Sundays now. So it's, it's an odd thing to tell, to say, because I, I think people look at me and they're like, you have the dream career, you know, you travel to these exotic places right. and photograph, you know? this and that and you know what are you talking about someday you know how how are you seizing the day i'm like well even me i i'm telling people all the time like get outside your comfort zone and blah blah blah. but for me to do that personally it requires me to set a goal and do something and and to be honest like this is way outside my comfort zone it's not comfortable and i I don't know shit about bikes and i don't know what (laughs) i'm doing so i had to learn all of that stuff and that keeps you fulfilled Right. right yeah i get that um well, we, we keep te- teasing it. So let's, why don't you tell people what the race was in Iceland? Uh, I mean, yeah, it's, absolutely. it's not a very well known race. And even me researching it for the podcast, like the whole website is in Icelandic, <laughs> like yeah. half, some of it was in Russian. I, you know, so the- yeah, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty classic. Like, okay, it's pretty simple. You know, there's, 
I would say there's two categories of ultra endurance. There's like the self-supported bikepacking ultra endurance, like the, you know, divide and yada, 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 um, which attracts a whole slew of badass people. And then there's kind of more of the race style, like the Ram raw, you know, race across America, race across the West, uh, race around Ireland. And then this wow cyclothon thing is kind of this obscure race that basically it caught my attention because I love Iceland, but also because there's not many places in the world where you can actually ride the circumference of an entire island. Hmm. You, you, I mean, you're literally riding around the entire island right. from point to point. That's it. And it's nonstop. Um, it's probably the most visually stunning ride I've ever done in my entire life. And I, I'm, I'm not kidding you. I, I can't think of a more beautiful place to ride a bike um, hmm. ever. I mean, you're passing waterfalls and glaciers and hot springs and um, rivers and mountains and valleys and you know everything you could imagine. Yeah. Um, in, in every hour, right? Like there's not a single moment where you're like, oh, this is kind of uninteresting. So anyway, it has a super unique format. There's nowhere else like it in the world. It's big enough to be challenging. Um, and it's long enough to be challenging. And the thing that makes it truly the most unique is that it's one of the only ultra endurance rides that eclipses the Arctic Circle, hmm. right? So, so the thing about Ram is like, yeah, it's hot and there's wind and you're at elevation, but you're not going to have like potential for like frost and snow and ice and like catabatic wind, like all of that could happen the whole time. You know, yes, right. it can happen, but like, we're talking like this is Iceland. <laughs> right. Um, and in race around Ireland and other places, it's, it's just different. Right. So the thing that's cool about this race is that you do have to prepare for anything. Like I, the kit of clothing I brought was like ridiculous, like everything from like, <laughs> full blown, like, you know, like uh, lobster claw gloves to like, you know, a summer race kit. Right. So, um, you, Dude, never you look know the business. I, I followed it all on Instagram. Uh, your stories that handsome Rob was throwing out there and yeah. number one, <laughs> it, that was awesome to be able to like go along on the journey. Um, and just, yeah, I mean, it was, it was great. kind of a last minute decision. It was really fun. Oh dude. Yeah, I'm like, so glad I you did that. I wasn't thinking about having him do that, but it was like, Oh man, the pe- pe- people were so psyched. It was like, people were like yelling like you need to send an update what's going on yeah. like are you dead <laughs> <laughs> my favorite one was uh i think someone commented like where is everybody else and he said uh um this is what first place looks like <laughs> <laughs> i know like well, it's, it's funny because i think i think most of the time people are like wait so it's a race and you know but you're like no we're in the solo category so we start a day ahead right yeah um, we start about 24 hours ahead of time and then there's only three of us and the two other competitors um, DNF this year. Okay. Wow. So, so you were the only yeah. solo finisher. Was that because yeah. of the, yeah, yeah. was the weather harder, more harsh this year? Dude, the weather was gnarly. Talk I mean, about it, man. I want to hear about it. I was well, watching that's, that's it, but I want to feel it. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, it's, it's hard to, to really say because I've, I've, I've driven this course a lot. It's just, you're riding around the ring road. There's, a, there's about 30 miles of gravel and it's like, pretty real deal gravel so you have to switch bikes um but most of it follows the ring road Iceland's really classic highway one you weave in and out of fjords you go through like a desert basically it's like where they trained the astronauts on the moon and then you come around the south coast and you pass all the glaciers and this and that um the most of the climbing about thirty thousand feet of climbing or so is in the first 24 hours which is really nice Mm. um so you kind of get through that you have a couple mountain passes and it gets pretty cold and pretty gnarly um, and, um, so the first 20 hours or so I had one of the best tailwinds I've ever had in my life. Mm, nice. Um, I mean, it was, it was insane. It was like four minute 40 or four hour, 45 century sub 10 hour, double century, 21 hours and 40 minutes for 400 miles. Like I never thought that was remotely possible. Like I was flying and I was, I was flying so much that everybody I know, was like, you know, everybody I know that I trained with, you know, was all go slow, you know, conserve. Uh-huh. I was way too excited. And in the beginning I was kind of like, I was like riding behind the, the other, the other soloist in the race, just trying to like pace him and this and that. And I was like, fuck it. I'm over this. I'm just going to go. I couldn't handle it. I was way too excited. And I was like, told my team, like, I'm just going to pass him. And they're like, don't do it. And I'm like, I'm out of here. And uh-huh. I, I just couldn't handle it. My legs were too jittery. And I just passed him, and then I, I never saw him again. Well, you went um, out but, there to find out what you were made of, so there's only one way to do right, it, and that's to and, push yourself, right? Right. 
and I, to be honest, I wish I would have started harder earlier, Yeah. <laughs> but I had this epic tailwind and it was like, it was amazing. And I just, I was crushing and I like, I literally made a deal with myself. I'm like, don't get it off the bike for anything right. until you have to. And I didn't get off the bike for 200 miles. Like I did not remove myself from the seat. Um, wow. and, uh, and then when I, I, you know, and I, and I, obviously when I did, I, I took like the longest piss in my life, but, um, <laughs> oh, is it, but I, <laughs> you read my mind. I'm wondering, Yeah. I yeah, mean, those pro I mean, guys like a, can do it while they're riding. So, you know, if you yeah, practice, I, I'm not that talented <laughs> at all. I, I would have crashed. Um, I definitely like, it was pretty funny, but yeah, I did that and, and I made a deal with my bladder and we, we, we came to the conclusion that it was okay. So, um, I basically, you know, rode for 200 miles and then, um, yeah. First, well, was that, that about first, eight hours? It was 10 hours, 10 hours. Okay. Yeah. 10 hours. Um, and you yeah. made a deal with and, your bladder. Yeah. I was just like, don't, like, you know, was that like, the mental, on me. That, well, I mean, that sounds yeah, interesting. I mean, that's, a, I mean, you're, you're mentally telling your physical body not to do something. Right. And I was just like trying to tell myself, I'm like, okay, that like, it was painful. Like, the whole, the whole experience was painful. Like, even though I had a tailwind, I mean, we're talking like I'm climbing 20,000 plus feet right. um, in that first 200 miles going through mountain passes. Like the thing about a ripping tailwind is that every so often it becomes a heinous crosswind and i've got pretty deep dish wheels i'm riding a 2019 roubaix with uh deep dish envies and so like i kind of chose this bike because it, it's it, it it's a great you know comfort bike it's not like a tt bike it's not like a you know it, but it's a great comfort bike and distance bike and but yeah. in those crosswinds it was really gnarly and so what ended up happening was mile hour 24 or whatever um, i get to this pass this big climb up this dirt pass called oxy pass and it basically takes you from the east the northeast of the country to the south to like the southeast of the country and um, it kind of drops you over a fjord terrifying gravel descent um and i'm and i mean a, a gravel descent that you should be riding a mountain bike on like right. a proper downhill mountain bike and i'm riding like a gravel uh one of the lauf cycling bikes that has an really really rad killer front suspension and and great travel but like you're in a pretty gnarly position to be like <laughs> to be going down that and it's it's midnight so it's it's midnight sun you can see all day right but it's dark enough to be like low vis all right you know yeah. and you can imagine like i'm i've been riding nonstop for 24 hours i've burnt probably eighteen thousand calories at this point and i'm like pretty smoked and so i'm like going down this gravel to set my my arms are starting to like cramp. My hands are cramping, you know, my fingers, my actual fingers, like my middle finger was like cramping sideways, you know, like weird things were happening. I get down from that. I'm pretty like emotionally jarred. And then I have, how many miles was that descent? Um, I mean, it was, it was a 30 mile, it was a 30 mile section of the route, oh, right? Wow, like a yeah. pretty, like a, like an eight mile climb and then like a 10 mile descent. Right. Um, yeah. But it's just like you're going slow and after going like 20, I was averaging 20 miles an hour for uh, 400 miles, you know, all of a sudden to be going like really slow and just like, you know, yeah, like just every, you're feeling every rock, like it hurts and your butt hurts. Uh, it was, it was kind of gnarly. Yeah, I've uh, been there. Because that's like the unique thing is that there's not a lot of races that force you to switch bikes like this. Right. Which I think is, which I think is kind of cool. You know, it mixes things up. Um, and so, uh basically I get down from that and then I'm in my favorite part of the country, the East fjords. And I kind of knew going into this, like I was looking at the weather. I'm, I'm pretty good at forecasting the weather there. I knew like, okay, the fun's over. Like now it's, it's headwind and, uh, and then potentially some rain. And, um, basically for the next 12 hours, 15 hours, I was, I was going into a pretty steady headwind. And then I hit this part of the country where, it's known for like having some of the strongest winds on the planet, right? Cause it's like the, some of the biggest glaciers right by the ocean. Okay. It's a, uh, you closer on Lake where like diamond beaches and all the glaciers kind of uh, cave into this lake and I'm riding towards it. And I can see up ahead these huge lenticular clouds, like the actual scariest lenticular cloud I've ever seen. I remember in my life. seeing the picture on Instagram. Yeah. That was wild. Dude, it, yeah, it was like, it was like beam me up. It looked like just a spaceship. And this thing was like funnel, funneling so fast uh, that I got around the point of the mountain and I, 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 I was standing up riding. I got around the point of the mountain and my bike almost blew out from underneath me. And I had to like sit down, put all my weight on that like back tire, you know, and, and like, just like 
not even like tuck to get arrow, but tuck to like keep the weight on. Um, because I, I had my just get your center like, gravity as low as possible. Yeah. And just like, tr- you know, um, and then just, you know, I'm just cranking it out. What sucked is it was harder than climbing than doing all the climbing. Right. It was the hardest. It was the hardest probably like four or five hours of the entire thing was just, you know, <sighs> slow mashing the gears, like trying to get through this thing. And I was straight roads, totally exposed. If you, if you look right, you have black sand. It's also like blowing across this. It's a, it's basically a lava had kind of eroded this, like this beach and then it had retreated. So it's all black sand and, and they get these like gnarly wind events where sand will like sandblast cars. So you can imagine when you're out there on a bike and you're just fighting and like, this is the point where my forearms are hurting, you know, and I'm, I'm fighting the bike, like physically fighting. Um, like, and I opened my mouth and sand would blow on my teeth and it just, you know, it was just heinous. Yeah. I, I don't want to like, you know, build it out to be worse than it was, but it was really no, terrible. I, mean, I, I, I um, think that's good. That's what, yeah. that's what I like to hear. That's what, yeah. that's what a podcast is for is like, okay, well oh, I yeah, saw the just, Instagram and I know it was rough, yeah. but like, I want to hear the nitty gritty oh, detail. Dark. It was, it was dark. It was like caffeine pills and like, I need, I needed to like just get anything to take my mind off of it. Yeah. And ultimately, um, did, did, ultimately I got through, I got through that section and I just, I felt like I had been at war. Like my ears were ringing and hurting cause it's so much wind, you know, that was a really, and Iceland, you know, gets some of the scariest, the wind is the scariest thing yeah. for sure. Yeah. Uh, then or at um, any other point during the ride, did you, uh, did you have any like doubts, like self doubts where you're just battling yourself no, mentally or were you all in zero, zero self doubt? I was all in. I mean, oh. I had really pretty severe near knee pain not knee pain but just knee like discomfort mm-hmm. right but I'd, i had worked through that um i had cycled through that before and i put like i had like some compression um knee compression stocking sort of things i like put on over my kit to like hold the knee hold you know just hold them in tight you know um and that that helped and you know i, I you know i changed my kit out you know reapplied all the lubes and creams and all the things that you put under there that help and that made a huge difference um, and you have to keep in mind, like I'm, I'm like racing. So I'm not, I'm not like, cool guys, let's take a break. Like I right. didn't, I, the longest break I took was I think 20 something minutes. Do you know your um, total stoppage time? I mean, wh- was it like under yeah, an hour? Was, no, no, no. It was the total stoppage time. The total riding time was like 48 hours, 50 minutes, something like that was my okay. total ride time. And my total time was 52 hours and 36 minutes. So there was a lot of pee breaks and there was a lot of 20 minute stops. Yeah. But like, um, but mo- mainly towards the end. And this is where I was going to say is like, I thought the wind was the worst part. And then the wind backed off and I was like, oh yes, finally, you know, I'm done going seven miles an hour on the flats. <laughs> like, um, and then it started to rain. Oh. And then when it started to rain, it was like nine hours of rain. But I luckily had a slight tailwind, like that just, just gave me the, the slightest bit of like inspiration. But that was definitely like the that was it was hard because what ended up happening was you went from being super clear and beautiful and at least you're fighting this this wind you could look around but all of a sudden it went from being foggy like 50 feet of visibility i'm in a tiny tunnel snow globe all i could see is like slight shades of green on the side of me and rain and then like you know it was foggy and rainy right so i'm just i'm in kind of this personal hell and that was really like the low point you know, obviously I'm at the end and it's raining and, and what, what ended up happening was I, I got really cold, like hypothermic cold and, and super wet. So I had to stop and change clothing um, once. And that takes a while, you know, to like put on all the layers. Yeah. Um, and then I had to stop and change clothing again towards the end because I was like in my full kit, everything. And I was still getting hypothermic or I mean hypothermic to the point where like when you're exerting a lot of energy, but you're still like chattering and you're cold and you can't warm up. That's a dangerous place to be in, you know? Um, and, uh, and obviously I hadn't been eating enough and, and it was, I had to like tell my team, I was like, you know, uh, you got to start honking the horn every 15 minutes because I'm not going to remember to eat. Right. Uh, And so like, I'm just eating anything I can by taking bites off of this and that, you know, soggy French fries or whatever. And it was, uh, that was sort of like your gas tank was full. I saw like, French fries and strewful waffles. <laughs> yeah. I, I probably consumed 
um, the human's limit of stroop waffles on the ride. It was like, it was like, tw- you know, 20 stroop waffles. Um, but yeah, that was the dark period. So can, started, I'd like to talk. I started hallucinating, hallucinating a little bit too, and that was pretty interesting. I want to talk about both those, so let's break it up. Um, I'm always okay. You're not going to do events like this, any kind of endurance event, without like getting in a bad spot, either physically or mentally. And then right. it's, it, every person has a decision to make: Are you going to keep going, or are you going to stop? Right? I mean, that's kind of what it right. boils down to. So you know, what would maybe, I don't, I don't know if you remember like how low it got, what you were dealing with internally and, and how you were able to like get yourself out of that. <laughs> um, I was definitely crying at one point, but, um, <laughs> but it was more of joy. It was more like a joyful thing. Yeah. Like, this is amazing. That's pretty, like, that's like awesome. you get to such an emotional state, you know, where I was like, I'm like, uh, somebody would bring me a pastry and I just like start crying. I'm like, Oh, my friends are so nice. Oh, you know? that's like, cool. um, it was weird, but ultimately the decision to stop or to, or to keep going, it's, it's one of, it's something that you make beforehand. Hmm. Like you make that decision beforehand. You, you don't make that decision on the ride. You don't leave it up to like, you don't leave it up to chance. So you, you prepare yourself chance, mentally, yeah. physically with your equipment, your nutrition beforehand, and then you're already committed. Exactly. And I think the thing is, is like, I, I had done a lot of really long rides, you know, to where like, I knew what to expect. I knew what this was going to feel like at mile 400. So it wasn't, it wasn't anything new. I think the key thing was just like, you know, was I prepared for like the, you know, was I prepared for all of these scenarios so that I, so that I wouldn't have to be so uncomfortable, you know, that I'm like really having to, you know, like, I don't know, push myself to a dangerous spot. Yeah. You know, and that's honestly what I, what I, what I did. I just tried to like bring the right clothing, bring the right kit, bring the right creams, bring the right, you know, this and that. So that if I got a saddle sore or if I got this, it was, you know, going to be fine. Yeah. Which it was, um, which it was. And and that honestly, it, it got really low, you know, things got really low, but it was more of just like at the end, it was kind of funny because I wasn't fighting so much. Like, am I going to stop? Am I going to, it was never really about that. It was more like, I really wanted to break the record by like more time. And now I, I kept having to set goals. I'm like, okay, I'm going to break the record by four hours. Okay. I'm going to break the record by three hours, you know? So this sounds weird, but like that was the, was the only way for me to keep pushing because I was really pushing hard. Right. Like it wasn't this like, you know, I mean, it's endurance riding. You're, you're not there to do like, you know, sightseeing tour, you know? So, um, so that was kind of my, my, thing moving forward i had to set small goals and i had to keep pushing for those goals and i actually meant to um, ask you going into it if breaking the record was your goal or did it become your goal during the race no it it was like my secret secret goal Mm -hmm. like don't tell anybody goal yeah but when i got to egla stodder in 21 hours and and they were like the race director was telling my team captain like nobody's ever done that i was like it's (laughs) on like i'm i'm doing this that's all you needed to hear well, I just, I owed it to myself and I owed it to my team to like, why not give it everything you've got? You trained for this. So like, try it, you know? And, um, I obviously wanted to win. Like I wanted to, to, to beat the other people in the race, obviously. But, um, I had three goals. Like one is like win the race. Second is like win the beat, like do finish under a good time, 60 hours. It's a really good finishing time. And then the other thing was just like, just finish. Right. Yeah. Um, so those are my three goals. And then like the fourth, the, the other goal is like the secret goal that you don't really manifest because yeah. you don't want to like, you don't want to like hold yourself to that. You know, <laughs> it's funny. Um, I, you and I kind of yeah. connected over the Lael interview. Um, and that's what I said to her is like my big goal. The thing that like I put in my own brain, but I never really told anyone about was getting an opportunity to interview her, you know, I feel like that would be yeah. like the pinnacle. Um, but I know, I know what you mean. It's like, it's good to always have that like internal carrot where you know that it's something that you're working for. Um, and, and whatever it is, whatever discipline of life that you're, you're, you're currently pursuing. I a hundred percent agree on that for sure. Um, Absolutely the best way to look at it. Well, I, st- I want to talk more about the hallucinations. Um, I'm yeah. always super um. <laughs> interested. I mean, it, anytime we're talking endurance sports, you're putting your body physically, mentally in places that they're not accustomed to being and, and weird things happen. So you want to talk a little bit about some of your experiences yeah. being slight, uh, sleep deprived? 
they weren't like, you know, these big grandiose, you know, like, Oh my gosh, I'm seeing a, um, a swimming pool in the desert. But it was like, I was, um, I was seeing, uh, I was seeing my, I was looking down at my fork and I thought it was wobbling mm. and I kept thinking, Oh my gosh, like I hope my wheel doesn't fall off. Like, yeah. like my fork was like loose, like a gummy piece, you know, like wobbling. And then at one point I'm looking out into the mist and it's all foggy and I see these like figures and I'm like, what are those reindeer? Are those horses? Um, apparently there was something there. I don't know what they were, but they just seemed like horses riding like with people on them, like out in the fog. And I'm like, who would be out here right now in the middle of nowhere? Um, and then I thought I saw a unicorn at one point too. Oh, nice. <laughs> it was really weird. Um, but that was like, I actually like, I would like see stuff and I'd point to it. And then like the, the, the SAG rig, they would, they would like, they would like agree. <laughs> They'd be like, yeah, yeah, I see it too. And I'm like, okay, good. Uh, uh, but the, the, the real, the funniest one was like after everything was over and the adrenaline wore off and um, I was af- after the, the finish line, um, I went to my friend's house. He had, you know, cause I was like telling myself, I'm like, don't just go to bed, you know, like you need to eat and you also need to like probably soak your body in like a, something hot, you know, to like loosen up. Um, cause I had done another race. I had done a, um, uh, a 600 K Renier. It wasn't a race. It was, you know, but we were, we were going through the fastest known time. And afterwards I was with um, a good friend of mine, Eric Nolan, who actually was a, a huge supporter in like helping me train. And afterwards, I just like went to my room, didn't eat, and passed out, showered, passed mm-hmm. out, and it was like I woke up like I felt like a brick, yeah, like a you know. And we were like really pushing it, like you know, going hard. And um, and anyway, so I was like, okay, go and you know, soak and this and that. And I did that. I was my my friend like poured kind of like a hot tub for me at his at his cabin in Iceland, and um, I was like asking him if I if there was like I thought I saw like a snake in the hot tub. <laughs> um, like a, like I was like, there's a, there's some kind of creature. What is that moving right there? And it was like a leaf blowing. And there's no reptiles in Iceland, so it was kind of. And I know that, and it was kind of like r- ridiculous, right? Wow. So, anyway, yeah. Um, but they were like lucid dreams, you know. It wasn't like yeah. I felt like I was being attacked by something. But, right. Nothing um, scary. Just like peculiar things happening. Yeah. Yeah. And to be honest, I I really tried to like take my caffeine consumption down prior to the trip. Yeah. So that when I did utilize caffeine as a supplement, it would, um, it would be more effective. Yeah. So is yeah. that what you did to kind of like, did you recognize yeah. that you're hallucinating? You're like, okay, I need to pop some caffeine and like snap back yeah. into this thing. I, I had like caffeine pills at the very end I used, but for the most part, I didn't take any caffeine for the first, I didn't, I'm, I don't drink coffee. So I'm not like, like my regiment isn't like wake up and drink coffee. Yeah. I just basically like my, you know, hour 20, you know, like hour 20. 20 like a normal ride day you know i i like started to get tired and started supplementing small amounts like don't like micro dosing you know like they're in shop blocks and then they're in this and i took a, like a voc tab which is like a green tea energy thing and then i took um some alpine start like coffee mixture in like a protein kind of shake thing and i just was like supplementing little bits of it but yeah towards the end i was like i gotta go for the going whole straight, you know yeah yeah exactly and i just i I'm not a big energy drink fan, so I didn't. I bought like Red Bulls, never drank them. Um, I've never had a Red Bull before. Really? So I, didn't, I didn't want like. Yeah, I've never had one. Oh. I'm just not a. I'm not a fan of like, supplement like like that stimulant yeah. sort of stuff. Yeah, I hear you. Um, so it was just kind of like, yeah, can I do this without it? Great, that'd be wonderful. And you know, I tried to push as hard as I could to yeah, like, see what unsafe. you can do, what your body can do without supplements. And then, is that what kind of what you're thinking? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, not not so much like I was on some purist regimen, but I just didn't I just didn't um need it I felt like and I I I started to take it not so much because I got tired like oh I'm I'm really tired it was because I didn't want to get unsafe like I I know that the hard thing is that when you're on the bike it's not I I wasn't so much about worried about falling asleep on the bike although that's something very real that could happen Mm. it's like I didn't I didn't want to like be making slow or sloppy decisions when I'm like on a technical descent or I'm I'm in the rain and it's the roads are wet. And you know, that was the kind of thing that I was more so like that, that caffeine I think helps to just keep you more aware. Absolutely. Um, so after your hot tub and you woke up the next day, how'd you feel? And, uh, dude, I I felt terrible. You know, I'm in the bike packing world. So, you know, the tour divide is going on right now. And, Yep. How would you feel about hopping on your bike that next day and going for and doing it again? 
I mean, the reality is if I had to do it the next day, I would have done it. I would have gone a whole lot less hard, you yeah. know, obviously well, of course, because, yeah. because I had, I had, I had just done three days basically, you know, of nonstop riding. And so the reality is if I was on the tour divide and I was riding for three days nonstop, I'd probably be willing to take a day to chill, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but ultimately, yeah, like I, it, it was a different type of race. Like every, yeah. every, every, um, every uh training ride that i did was self-supported i've never done a supported race in my life um i didn't want to be supported actually i thought that it'd be way cooler if it was just self. i i've actually thought a lot about going back to iceland and trying to do the fastest known time self-supported around the country oh wow because it would be it would be way more interesting and way more like technologically challenging with just timing and and you know charging and all that stuff right yeah um but it'd be awesome really awesome but so it was a weird thing for me to have like this vehicle. Like I rolled out from the start line super heavy. Like I normally do like tons of water and this, and that people are like, people are looking at me. They're like, man, you're carrying a lot of stuff. You know, like, there's a van behind I'm, you, right? <laughs> yeah, no, it was so funny. And I was like, yeah, I'm like, I don't know how to do a handoff. So I, I don't really want to learn right now. Uh, but that's just like the, you know, quirky nerdy part of it. But I, to be honest, I, I, I would love my dream is to like, you know, do a year of kind of these more in, endurance uh, race formats. And then, and then I would love to get into um, tour divide and, and a whole bunch of other ones. I've kind of got a list of, of ones that I'd love to, yeah. I'd love to attempt, you know, just for fun, you know, not even not to like necessarily, you know, go for a, a, a winning time but, or anything like that. But that's kind of my dream. Well, it's just um, such a great fact, way to experience the world, man. I mean, if you're oh going to ride gosh. the tour divide or the AZT or caught a lot of trail or whatever is on your radar, I mean, um, they're just really, in my opinion, isn't a better way to experience the world than via bicycle. And you get to learn about the world, learn about yourself. And it's just, you know, it, I, it makes a lot of sense. You don't always I, have to be going for the record, you know? Oh, a hundred percent. And that's the thing is like, that's, you know, I, all the rides I did up to that, they weren't, they weren't for some, you know, fundamental end goal. It was more just because it's fun. It's a, it's an experience. Yeah. But I, the one thing I would say too, about the bikepacking thing is that I, what I really love about it, and maybe this is just the full nerd in me is that I love whittling down what you need to yeah. just bare essentials Yes. and then whittling it down a little more and then kind of realizing like, cause this is what I do on every trip. You know, we, we go to these places, we, we, we think we bring what we think we need. We need more, we need less, whatever. Uh, but it's so fulfilling to kind of like have that experience, you know, of like introspection and this and that. And, and just realizing you go, you come home to your house or wherever you live, you know, your van or, and you're like, I have so much, mm -hmm. you know, I, I just survived off of like these, you know, the 10 pounds worth of stuff for like so little. It was, that's such a fulfilling thing to me. That dude, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's such an empower, powering thing to know to get to the point and it takes everyone a while no one just jumps in i think and says oh i i can go do this but you know baby steps you whittle down your gear you whittle up your gear you figure it out but the end result is it's it's such an amazing feeling to like come home and realize that everything you have is just like a luxury that you really don't right. need it that you really are totally. capable of going out into a wild or remote area and surviving yeah. you know and having a good time and really like being in that moment and not being distracted by everything else you know like those are really special oh special times oh it's the best that introspection that whittling down effect and yeah. and that kind of refiner's fire is like a really amazing thing and we find that in a lot of different things we do cycling is just one of them i think but it's yeah. it's honestly um for me that's like that's the spice of life right that's why you do those things is because you you kind of want to see what you're made of right and you want to see you know what you what you what you can endure i guess yeah life is too, I guess that's it's, why I, it's made too yeah. easy on us man every once in a while you got to go out there and you know prove to yourself that you're still a badass like okay i i, I can still do this you know Right. Oh, and that, that was the crazy thing is like, I've driven around that country so many times and I've, you know, it rains and you, you run to the comfort of your car, just like that Edward Abbey quote, you know, mm -hmm. or, you know, it rains and you zip your tent flap up or whatever. And that's, it's, there's always this element of like hiding out mm -hmm. and uh, not being exposed. And I just, I love the idea of like, no man, for like in, in all of this weather and, you know, in all of this diverse weather and all this, you know, harsh conditions, like I was just there exposed, you know, so like, in the elements and, and that that's like a really beautiful thing to like be able to walk away with that, you know that's another poignant uh 
point is just that well it's a poignant point it's a poignant remark <laughs> uh the it's the poignantest one yet um it, it is that feeling of just being uh small like i was just talking about how it's empowering to know that you can do that but at the same time when you immerse yourself in the wild and you're subject to nature and you're really just out there um it's also a really humbling experience um so that's an interesting oh, totally. juxtapose, I guess. I guess I guess the uh, the the badassery you feel comes after you survive all that, because <laughs> yeah, in the moment yeah, you can feel I, pretty small. Oh yeah, and I, I think that's a big part of it, though. You know, I think that the insignificance is very much um, is very much a part of it. You right. Know? I uh, I really actually kind of enjoy enjoy that equally as much. Yeah, I do too. I I've, I'm learning to embrace the weather specifically, you know, and just be like, okay, I'm in it. This is what it is. Just do, just roll with it. You know, don't make it into right. a thing. Don't, you know, don't worry about it. It just, th this is what's happening right now. And just, okay, let's keep going. You know, uh, it, yep. it, it takes a little while to, to get to that point. Or at least it's something that I've, I've worked towards. Um, going back to the Iceland race, um, kind of just in closing with that, I'm curious, did you, did you prove anything to yourself or did you learn anything about yourself as a result no, of it? I mean, not really. It wasn't like, I'm not, I wasn't there. I'm not, I'm not a cyclist, you know, I don't, I'm not like there trying to like, you know, add, add, add a, you know, credentials to my not list of accolades or something like that. I, I honestly, I was telling my wife, it was so like emotional and like fulfilling that I was like, I wish that nobody was at the finish line. Like I just felt, I felt kind of silly. I'm like, you guys, it's like 11 PM and people are there and there's like, you know, we're, they're spraying champagne and you know, it was, it, there was a lot of country pride. It was like, you know, yeah, you set the new course record. This is amazing. Like, um, and I was so stoked, but I just was kind of like a party. was like, man, I wish that nobody was here and I could just like kind of, you know, have a moment to myself yeah, um, to think about it and, and take it in. But, and, um, but I was also like really honored right at the same time. I just didn't, I, I admit that's more of maybe a self-worth thing. Like I, I just didn't really feel like I, like I'd done anything that great. And I just rode my bike around. Um, but, but I mean, I think that was super, to like it, more of your personal reason for being out there and, and, and yeah, it's not about yeah, yeah, the yeah. record necessarily. I mean, the record is cool. And obviously that was a big motivator for you while you were out there, but, yeah. um, just being out there for you, um, riding your bike, enjoying it, pushing yourself, you know, I mean, that's really what it should be all about. A hundred percent. I mean, that's, that's, that's what it's always been about. And it was just such a, such a huge experience. Like I'll fully never feel the same way about, about Iceland and about like driving those roads. And I go back all the time. Like I'm going back twice this year and all, all I'm going to think about is like, man, this is, that's like where it's at. You know, that's the experience right there. Yeah. Shifting your gears away from bikes a little bit, but I know that you had your wife and your mom out there. I don't know if you had your whole family, but I, I saw that they were out there. What was it like for you to uh, share that with your family? Uh, honestly, it was a really, really cool um, experience because I, uh, I, I definitely was, um, I definitely was somebody who never grew up with a passport, never grew up with the opportunity to travel. And my mom, sacrificed a lot for me and um like a ton and uh and we have a really tight relationship and um it was just me and her for a lot of years and so this was her first international trip out of the country mm. um she'd been to mexico and been to some places but like she never left north america yeah. never been been anywhere real international right so um i i brought her there um as just like a as a trip you know like this is the first time i've ever traveled to iceland that wasn't for work either so this was just like this cool full circle experience you know my mom wasn't at the finish line I, I didn't want them to be there because i didn't i didn't want that stress of like you know them being worried about me or the, anything so they they were they arrived that morning and i spent the next three days showing them around and it was really that was like the quintessential that was like the best thing ever right yeah. that was the the award right it was really cool and it was really uh, fulfilling for me that's what personally I... and professionally yeah. Yeah. That's why, yeah, that's why I kind of asked the question. It looks like that was kind of like your reward, you know, uh, being able to share it with your mom and your wife. And, um, you obviously have a special relationship with Iceland. And so I thought that was pretty neat. It was honestly, it's honestly, it's cool. Cause like now she has like that same kind of memory of like the places I do, 
Like it's this really amazing place. Right. Yeah. Now you can actually like, she'll know what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. Hey, I only have a couple more for you. I forgot to ask, um, how the heck did you find time to train? I mean, I ride, I ride in my office. I have a little bike at my desk. I'll ride a couple hours in my office and my desk and I'm just like spinning my legs, but you're still spinning your legs. And what um, is, I saw a picture of you sitting at your desk on like a some, white stationary bike, just pedaling yeah, and dude, working. It's just like, it's like, why not? You know, like burn a couple. Extra it's calories. awesome. What is that bike that you're yeah. riding? called a philo sport i don't know i bought it on amazon okay. i'm not like endorsed by them or anything gotcha, it's just yeah. a rad random little it's comfortable i like it i actually prefer it to like just standing you know because your legs are kind of heavy and this thing just like keeps blood moving it feels really good that's crazy um, man i love it yeah it's been fun it's been pretty rad i actually like really love yeah uh, i love the opportunity to to just put miles on and that is a good good question like i am really busy like i'm gone all the time i have two boys I have a wife, we have a business, you know, whatnot. And I, I really honestly just forced the time to happen. Like I realized when I got more serious about training, I realized it's not so much about how many miles you ride every day. It's about the big rides. It's about like one big ride a week and realizing what your body's going to do under the, the time stress, right. Of like 10, 12 hours, right. Not like, cool, I'm going to go ride three to four hours every single day which I did as well. I rode, I rode about two and a half hours every day, about 50 miles. Um, and what I ended up doing was I used to ride like outdoors every single day. And then, um, I kind of realized it was becoming not dangerous, but just like it was wear and tear on the bike, wear and tear on me, like the time it sucks to like prep to go outside. So I started to do indoor miles, um, daily and just like ride indoors, um, for an hour or two, you know, and like I'd watch a movie or I just chill and, um, and just put out, you know, whatever Watts I needed to. And, um, I'm not, I was never really scientific about it. I just basically would ride a base of 50 miles a day. And then one day a week, I'd do a 200 to 300 mile ride. Wow. Um, and that was it. (laughs) But I mean, you got to think about it. I mean, that was it. I still don't understand where you find the time. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it was like waking up at 4am ride till right. You know, wake up five, ride till a night, not enough. (laughs) <laughs> um, not enough at all. You know, I, that's I, the I only said, answer. I, I mean, there's no so way to honestly, but I mean, you gotta think about it. Like you go to bed at nine, 10. Okay, cool. I can get up at like, you know, a lot of days I'd, I'd get up at like six in the morning, ride till eight, eight thirty. Then I'd help out with the kids and I'd go to work and I'd come home early and help out with the kids. And then if I'm traveling, you know, I would, I, I don't have the opportunity to do that. So I would, that's why like the time that I was home was so crucial to like put in that time. But what I found is like, I would just take one day a week for myself. And that day a week was like the, the quintessential like training day. Right. So, um, you know, a 200 mile day that only takes you about 12 hours, you know, or that's how long it was taking me 12 hours or less. Yeah. So I would go to a 200 mile day. And a lot of those 200 mile days, I'd be like, well, I don't just want this to be all day riding my bike. I would wake up at midnight, ride till noon, and be done. And the rest of the day I'd hang out and then I'd catch up on sleep on Sunday. Um, or I'd do like a 300 mile day, which is pretty much an all day affair, right. you know, but still I'd like start the night before, ride the night and then I could like be home for dinner. Right. So, um, it, it honestly, it, I, I found it wasn't that hard. It was, you know, it was hard, but it wasn't that challenging. It was just more a matter of like forcing the time, you know, yeah. Forcing yourself to like have be diligent and find the time. Yeah. Yeah. You just have to make it a priority and do it. But yeah. right. And now that I, now that I know what's possible in this, I feel like I don't need to put in as many miles because I basically just kind of followed like the Ram training regimen, like the, whatever the guys at Ram were doing, I was basically trying to do the same thing. Yeah. That was kind of, that was kind of what I looked, what I, what I saw it as. So I know we're just getting off, uh, one race, but do you have anything, uh, coming up next or anything else that you're going to be training for? Yeah. Um, I don't even know if I should express it though, cause it's so stupid. Um, me and, uh, me and a friend of mine, um, are thinking about trying to, to do a, a FNT, um, and attempt at the length of California. Nice. Yeah. North to so, South or South which, to North? North to South. I mean, you got to ride those winds or else you're, you're a madman. <laughs> um, and I think also too, you'll be coast, you'll be ocean side. So you'll want to see the beach. Yeah. You know? it's, it makes, it makes it more pretty. Yeah. 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 Um, um, but yeah, I mean, 
That sounds that's awesome. kind of what I've got. Yeah, and then I'm, I'm doing a. I've got like four or five other races. I'm doing this ri- this ride for ALS called Saints to Sinners. Um, uh, that's that happens at the end of this month. It's 536 miles from Salt Lake City to Vegas. Yeah. And that's pretty gnarly because it's through like the middle of the desert heat, like 115 degrees. And oh, it's, man. it's I did it last year and it was heavy, like nose bleeding and you're just, yeah, it's crazy. But, Dude. uh, and then there's, I might do the 508. Um, I, I was going to maybe do the Hoodoo 500, which is another, um, endurance ride through like Utah desert. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, well, I'm just having, having fun. I'm not, I'm not trying to be too serious about anything. And, Dude, you shouldn't be, um, it, it should be about fun. I, I, that's yeah. something I preach, man. This is, this should yeah. be fun. Right. Well, I get, I, I know, I know my character, I get too serious in general and I, I know that I get competitive. And so like, I don't need to add extra competition yeah. on top of <laughs> the competition that already exists, Right. you know? So, well, yeah. man, I'm, I am beyond stoked that, uh, that you're a cyclist and you're contributing to this community. I think that uh, at least from what I can tell, it's, it's kind of gone under the radar a little bit. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity yeah. to be able to yeah. shed some light on, um, uh, on, on the, another side of Chris Picard that maybe not as many people are familiar yeah. with. Um, so yeah, thank well, you. I'm so stoked, man. I really appreciate your time today and, and, and great to kind of just connect with like-minded folks always. And I'm, I'm literally pulling up at the airport right now. So it's perfect timing. I'm going to, um, I'm going to jump off and then head, uh, head to Russia. For three weeks. <laughs> well, dude, uh, yeah, thanks again. I will let you go have fun in Russia and I hope we can do it again. So I, what I really want to do is I want to take you to a place in Texas on a bike packing trip one day, if you ever have the time. Do it. And uh, if you bring your let's... camera, I think you'll find, uh, some nice things to take pictures of along the way. I'm, I'm super into that. Let's, let's email about that for sure. I'd be super down. That'd Sweet. be awesome. All right, dude, have a good trip in Russia. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Peace. See you and he calls himself a non-legitimate cyclist. Give me a break. That dude is about as real uh, as they come. I'm more, I gotta be on. I'm more impressed by his training than the actual race. Like, he put in the freaking work. And then it came to the race, and it was just about execution. You know, I think he said it like, I asked him, what'd you learn about yourself or something like that. And, uh, you know, he said nothing really. And the reason why is cause he'd already figured it out. He already ridden in the worst conditions. Um, great example, great example. You know, this guy's a hardcore dude who is putting himself, uh, through the ringer just for fun. I love that. He's out there doing this for fun. He doesn't have to go out there and ride bikes. He doesn't have to push himself like that, but he's getting joy out of it. He's finding uh, fun ways and exciting ways to experience the world and to find out ways to push his limits. And that's what it's all about. You know, that's, that's a great message. All right, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for tuning in one more time. If you love the show, the content, the people that I have coming on, uh, please consider sending your support in one or three ways or all three uh at patreon you can find me at bikes or death you can go on my website bikes or death.com and click that affiliate link bookmark it and use it every time you shop online that's an easy easy way to support the show um and then lastly just go on itunes and leave a five-star review i so appreciate all the support so far yo you guys are awesome i mean it thank you so much um God, what else? I feel like there's something. Oh, yeah. Go ride your damn bike.